Throughout history, free thinkers have outraged the religious with their wacky ideas about the virtues of free speech, reason, and of course, eating babies. Now, God is dying, and it's time to dispose of his remains. From the pits of hell, Satan sends two puppets of the imperialist West and the Zionist Jews against God, Islam, and tiny kittens to bring you their propaganda and conspire for a new world order. This is Secular Jihadist for a Muslim Enlightenment with Ali Rizwi and Armin Navabi. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Secular Jihadists for a Muslim Enlightenment. Am I still choppy? No, that was good. Okay, I'll do it again. Welcome, no, that everybody. Was good. That was good. That was good. That was good. You okay. Um, uh, I'm, my name is Ali Rizvi, and with me is Armin Navabi. Armin, how are you? I'm fine. You're doing well? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> are you? <laughs> <laughs> he's. Uh, he seems like he's okay. And so... Yeah, we're talking today about about comedy and about jokes and you know funny stuff. And our guest today is uh, someone I've been following for a while, and he's hilarious. And, um, so Jamie Kilstein, welcome. Is it Kilstein or Kilstein? You said you've been fucking following me for a while, and we're, it's Kilstein. Yeah, I have been following you for. You didn't know that. No, no, no! Or, but you no, didn't but know. You didn't know, know his name, know my though. fucking name. It's Kills. You don't even know. <laughs> to be fair, I've had. I've never uh, heard you say your name. Yeah, I, I've never I, heard you say I, it. I, I, I used to go on back when I used to go on TV. People knew my name, and now they just read libelous print about me, and it can really go either way: Kilstein or Kilstein. That, that's what I'm saying. Like that's all I've. I've never heard you say your name. I've heard you it's all do all kinds of other stuff. So I, I think it was fair. Yeah. It was fair yeah, but yeah, now sure. I know. It's now Kilstein. I know. So. Yeah. All right, but let's so, get to the heart of it. You used to like go into the juicy stuff. All right, so I wanted so thing. for those who don't know about Amy was uh, so you you were like pretty big. You had a show called Citizen Radio. You yeah. interviewed Noam Chomsky. You had Rachel Maddow. Yeah. You had been on the you performed on Conan. You've been on the Chris Hayes show on MSNBC. Yeah. You've things done going, uh, things are going great. Things well, I mean, I think they're still gonna go great, but the and then. Right, mm -hmm. and then, and then that mm -hmm. that was a time when you were known as a male feminist, right? And you were sort sure. of like, I guess, very sort of, uh, uh, from what I've read, sort of a preachy kind of leftist. Kind of. I mean, I thought it was. I yeah, we'll go into it, and like, I will one hundred percent shit all over myself. But for the record, like in hindsight, back then, I mean, I was. It was a lot of like, hey, rape's bad. <laughs> like, I didn't think it was like the craziest <laughs> extreme shit in the world. But yeah, I mean, I definitely, when I was labeled that, even though I felt kind of uncomfortable, because I feel like the term male feminist sounds like I'm like driving around in a van trying to like lure in the women with like Tegan and Sarah music. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I went with it because I was like, oh, people like me. And like, yeah, I think women should have equal rights. So like, fucking sure i'm a male feminist you know and but, i still yeah. believe the things i believe you know okay okay yeah. but isn't saying rape is bad is so cringe because i didn't I, I don't know maybe i'm like out of touch with reality yeah. but is there like a pro like yeah rape is great movement going out there right now that like well that we need i to, would like... say fucking armin if you say that saying rape is bad is cringe i would put you in that category <laughs> well i mean i just think like the, the only reason why i think it's cringe is because i'm like Oh yeah. Also, you know what? Murder. I'm gonna stand. Well, yeah, take I a know. brave stance against murder here as well. Like if no, you're, while I, you're at it, <laughs> I told. I I totally know what you mean. I mean, right. and again, like it wasn't like I was like, "Welcome to the Jamie Rape is Bad Hour." It was sort right. of just, you know. I mean, I was being. There was a lot of shit that I was learning for the first time about like the fucking statistics and about and, like look, like it's it's way easier for me as like a dude to fucking go hit the top. Like, I've never had to, like, cover my drink at a bar. Like, just talk about, like, basic shit like that, which, again, I still empathize with, with, like, all the bullshit I've gone through. I'm like, yeah, there's some shit that fucking sucks really hard for women yeah. that, like, right. I'll never have to... I'll never have to deal with. Um, right. But anyway, look at me. I'm going right back to the shit that got me in trouble. I Did really... You I really should have just made a living being the like fuck women guy and just being like, yeah, I was wrong. And then I can start no. the pro rape camp. 
No, no. I think I just I think it's good. So let me just tell everybody first that you have tonight's like a big night because you have a, a new album coming out tomorrow. It's kind of a first for you in a way that you know. Well, you're going to talk about uh, what's different about this album compared to the stuff that you've done in the past. Um, yeah. So this it, album is pro rape. Uh, to be clear, that's the biggest. Thing. Well, considering it's called 25% capacity, I don't, I, I don't know. So the album's called 25% capacity. Mm -hmm. Right, and it's uh, it's coming out uh, tonight. Well, at midnight tonight, I guess, and yeah. then on iTunes, Spotify, everywhere. Uh, Jamie Kilstein, uh, twenty five percent capacity, and then tomorrow you're also going to do a live stream like yes. this, where you just go to live comedy. Yes, and by, and by the way, I should say I love you guys, and thank you for having oh. me. And I'm 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 I understand this shit you've gotten. I can't wait to talk about that as well, because like. I have, yeah. I have I have thoughts on that too, um, and I I miss the days where the when I would go on podcast the introductions were like only like you've seen this guy on Conan funny man Jamie Kilstein and now the intros are always like very long and they're like he's been through a <laughs> harrowing tale like and tragedy and he's overcome and he hasn't killed himself and welcome the desperate Jamie Kilstein and I'm like hi everybody but anyway. that's a lot more <laughs> it's a lot more compelling right so so what we're what I wanted to kind of go through is your journey because I think it's really interesting there's some parallels with us. Sure. I mean, so you you had this time when you know you had, had certain these political leanings, um, yeah. you know, which I think all of us do. We've all talked about how we're all leftist liberals. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, you know, something. That, so you had that incident, right, where you had these allegations mm -hmm. from from women in your workplace, right? And well, so I didn't have a workplace. So just to be like, yeah. very very okay. clear before we get into like the allegations, uh, which is like. At worst, if the articles were true, which a lot of them were not, uh, mm. I was accused of cheating, which I hate that I fucking did that, and of uh, consensual one night stands. And one, uh, one girl said that I was flirting with her in DMs, and when she said she had a boyfriend, I stopped. And then another girl said that, sorry, woman, don't want to get in more trouble, um, said that uh, we spent the night together. We actually didn't have sex. Um, she said something like, like in the article that fucking trash me ruined that portion of my life said, um, that like, she'd never been treated so well. Like it was something like that. It was like, it was the nicest the guy's ever been to me or some line like that. And then she said, um, but then he called me a road fuck on his podcast. And then Jezebel in the article said Jezebel could not find that quote in because in parentheses, yeah, because I'm not talking about slaying road pussy on my feminist podcast that I host with my wife. That's an insane thing. Um, if I did do that, though, I'm an asshole. I'm not like a sexual predator. And the problem is, and what still uh, gets me to this day, and the reason we're talking about it, and the reason some of your listeners were like, are you going to ask him about it, even though this happened years ago, is the fucking headlines use words like sexual misconduct and like really horrible shit that mm -hmm. make it look like I was accused of like, like you're a Weinstein and not a e Kilstein. E thank you. Yeah. <laughs> or Kilstein in that, in that case, Kilstein. fucking say it however you want. <laughs> um, but yeah, dude. And so like, look, I don't want to play the victim. I fucking hate that. I cheated. I hate that it happened. I still have a lot of shame about it. I've been working really hard on myself, blah, blah, blah. But like the fact that I'm even in like sexual misconduct conversations, especially now, like years later, like I've done, a lot of good shit. I've had a lot of really lovely relationships and, you know, eight years after I cheated something like that, four years after this article came out, which is again, kind of minuscule uh, in hindsight, um, that it still comes up or if I get a gig, I'm still waiting for it to get canceled. Or if I make a new like friend, who's like a female, I like this happened the other day. I have like this, I've made this pretty famous lady friend, like just like actual friends. And we became so close and I had to like call her and be like, Hey man, just so you know, like I still have a couple trolls who might like tweet you that shit. And like had to literally like tell like my homie about like my sex life and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, and the other thing is, I was telling my manager before I got on this podcast is a lot of the stuff I would say to defend myself sounds like crazy, like, 
I don't know the way to say the it. The stuff but like, you used to slam other people for saying when they yes. used to do themselves. Yeah, and I think right. I think I even said this on Rogan a couple of years ago, where like, right. yeah, if a guy was like, she's making it up, she's jealous, she's crazy, and I'm like, that's fucking sexist, blah blah blah. And then when people were like, hey man, what happened to you? And I'm like, well, honey, she's making it up, and she's a little jealous, and she's fucking crazy, and like, yeah. you know what I mean? But I'm like, I didn't want to be that guy. I would rather, and maybe this was a mistake, but I would have rather been, you know, look, I was broke, I lost everything. I tried to kill myself, but I actually had a really nice girlfriend who stopped that. Um, and, uh, but I was getting offers from like a lot, and I'm sure you guys have too, where it's like, I'm sure more right wing shows would rather have you guys on oh, yeah. than, than shows you would align with politically. And that's still the case for me. You know, I think I'm going on one lefty. It's not even a lefty show. I'm going to go on rising next week. Cause they get shit from the left as well. But like, you know, Glenn Beck had me like all these like right wing places had me on and I stayed true. I stayed fucking liberal. I talked about the liberal things I believe in uh, that I'm sure maybe even a lot of your audience doesn't. Uh, but then, uh, you know, I would talk about my problems with the left, blah, blah, blah. And I got offers. I had a book deal offer when I had no money to write that kind of book that you know, one of those books like why I left the left and the right was right. And I, well, I, made... I, I was going to say, like, what made you what prevented you from becoming another Dave Rubin? I almost did. Hmm. And and I just I just didn't. Well, it wasn't authentic. Like, I remember I had one night where I was in this apartment and I had like not a lot of money, but a lot of money for me. Uh, back in the day when I was married and stuff like that. And the podcast was doing really well and blah, blah, blah. And then I'm in LA. I'm in this like flea covered apartment and my cat got fleas and I'm crying, holding my cat who was like my only buddy. And I'm like apologizing to my cat. And I'm like, this is so fucking pathetic. And so that night, and I was like, you know what? And I was being rational. I wasn't like, I'm going to sell out. I was like, I was, you know, I was like, you know what? These conservatives are being really nice to me. And the more I talk to them, the more I find out that like we disagree, but like they're nice dudes. And it's just for me, it wasn't even money. It was just people being nice to me and me not having to feel like I'm like some fucking sex criminal. Right. And and then I go, you know, they want me on their shows more and I could probably have my own show. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to check out this Ben Shapiro guy. I, I've never actually watched him. I'm going to I'm going to give him a watch. And then I went on YouTube. And then I watched Ben Shapiro and then I went, nope, this is not for me. And then I was like, I can't do it. Like, I just, I didn't actually believe that shit. And at the, the, the best case scenario, I would have been like an Alan Combs on like a, you know, Fuck a show. Hannity. Yeah, yeah. Where I'm just like, Hey, don't say that. And like, that's it. With that said in real life, and even on the podcast, I've had great conversations with conservatives I disagree with. And that's an ability. That's a thing I never would have done before, you know. Um, and so that's really cool. But going completely full circle and dipping my toes into that world, I unfortunately, for my bank account and career, I'm like, like you guys, I'm like, I'm still pretty fucking left. And it's a little heartbreaking that my political beliefs align with a group that doesn't want me, but it's also, this is going to sound cheesy, but it's also kind of empowering knowing that nobody can tell me I believe something for like an angle because I'm positioning mm. for something. And I'm like, no, 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 my beliefs fuck me career wise. And it's just how I feel. I believe in justice. I believe in, you know, social justice. I believe in, you know, these causes and uh and yeah no one on the left wants me so like cool man i'm just gonna like try to help people on my podcast and talk about mental health and fucking pro wrestle and enjoy my life instead of fighting with people on the internet well you're very articulate when you talk about all of this stuff and it's actually really compelling so um I, I i think it's great that you're doing it and you know so we've all i read about this quite a bit you know, before yeah. having you on, I actually hadn't before, but I kind of dug into it a little bit more. And I agree with you. I think those headlines 
there were a lot of headlines. When you look at the actual allegations, the worst of them, it doesn't seem like that at, at most they're equivocal. So, I mean, the, the point is that, you know, right now you're here where you are. You've kind of been through what you've been through. Yeah. So let's just. We're yeah. Gonna... And, and, and like, and I totally, I get it. And I mean, the thing is that like, I still want to fight for women who have had to deal with like actual predatory assholes. Mm -hmm. And you know what I, what's crazy. Cause I still have so much shame about it. And what's crazy is whether it's my female friends, my feminist friends, or the, the majority of my podcast listeners are female. Um, people will say shit like, I hate talking about this, but people will be like, I feel bad for you. And I realized that I kind of uh, compartmentalized a lot of the shame I had and a lot of the shit I've gone through. Where like, there are times where like, I had like a fucking anxiety attack when you were like, hey, we have to talk about this stuff. And like, I had to call my manager and blah, blah, blah. And my friends will be like, Jamie, you have PTSD. And I was like, no, I don't. Like, because I don't want to make it about me and I don't want to be the victim. And I even said this on Rogan's where I'm not going to become one of those guys who's like, women fuck over men just as much. No, there are crazy fucking asshole women. There are creepy fucking asshole guys. And so that's where I was wrong, right? I'm the like, believe all mm. women, just like, like 100%. Um, I was definitely self righteous. I was definitely up my own ass. I thought I was doing the right thing. You know, uh, Rogan always defends me when he brings me up, but. Sometimes he goes, yeah, Jamie just found like a niche and like ran with it. And I'm like, buddy, I wish that was true. I wish I had like that much uh, 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 like uh, career calculation where I was like, this is going to be great or else it wouldn't have ended so tragically. Like I believed the shit I believed in. Um, but what I was going to say is that I'm never going to be the person, even with what happened to me who says that men being accused is like as bad as fucking rape or whatever. What I will say is that, and my female friends say this all the time, is that when you do falsely accuse somebody or when you do, you know, even the Aziz thing, when the Aziz thing happened, me too lost a lot of fucking steam. And yeah. the, the problem is, is like, does it fuck over men? A hundred percent. But what's also not talked about is it fucks over women. And it fucks over women who were actually raped, who were actually in like emotionally abusive right. relationships, because now you're just you're lowering the mm. the the bar, and so it's so much easier for guys just to be like, oh, that's just another fucking Aziz thing or whatever. Right. So, like the way I look at it is that most of the accusations are legit, but if the false accusations, like I'm just making up numbers right now, if sure. the false accusations go up from half a percent to 2%. That's a huge increase. Yeah. And that 2% that that going from half a percent to 2% is going to do a lot of damage to the 98% for example of the correct accusations, right? Because it's going totally. to be so much so 2 like that that's a lot of stories that people are going to use as an example for why we shouldn't take the accusation seriously. Yeah. Right? And if you if you spread ideas of uh, believe all women uh, without do, do without any investigation or any due process, you are going to encourage that half a percent to increase to two two percent by yeah. telling people that you're welcoming all accusations or whatever they are. Right? It's still going to be a minority, but that's a major increase that is going to really hurt the ninety eight percent of the people that have serious accusations that need to be taken seriously. Yeah, and I mean that's why what you guys do is important too. Is like people who have experience like more women should speak out like i'm not going to be the fucking anti me too guy because i also think a lot of really good has happened but i'm like if 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 you know more muslims would speak out against uh extremism if more women would speak out against that if more cops would speak out against abuse you know it's like it's so bizarre that the groups we get affiliated with we feel like, especially nowadays with social media, that we have to, that we have to like blindly defend our group when in reality, like if I'm a cop and I see that George Floyd shit, I'm going to be infinitely more furious 
than my buddies who aren't cops. Like I'm a jujitsu guy. And if some guy was going around using like beautiful jujitsu to like attack women, I'm like, I'm going to be like, Hey, we should probably fucking stop that guy. Right. Like, but instead yeah. we don't do that. We just feel like because we live in a time where everyone is just pick a fucking side. If there's no gray area, if you don't believe everything we believe, you're not a progressive anymore. If you don't believe everything we, you, you know, you're this blah, blah, blah. Um, um, you can't actually have conversations and then people get so goddamn defensive that they won't call out their own because they're like, I just don't want to get shit, man. And so they just kind of be quiet and, 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 and back off. It's kind of like what you were saying about when you were, uh, when, you know, you had the left, you're like, the left doesn't want me, but you know, I saw Ben Shapiro and I was like, no, I'm not going to do this because yeah. you want to stay true to your beliefs. And that's, you, know, you should be able to do that. It doesn't matter. Like your beliefs, are your beliefs, just because they're not aligned with this other tribe yeah. that tends to lean on the same side of things doesn't necessarily mean that they're any less legitimate. And that's one of the traps that, you know, to avoid tribalism, people, uh, or to, to, to uh, kowtow to tribalism, people tend to try to choose sides. So yeah. that's how you end up with the Rubens going on the left. But I, I just want to say, yeah, sorry, Armin, go ahead. No, I just wanted to quickly show you how relatable the stuff that you're saying is. This is what I posted uh, just this August. I said I, uh, on Facebook, I mean, I posted on Twitter as well, but now I can't show you because I'm suspended on Twitter. Uh, I said, I will never have, I, I will never have a why I left the left video. I promise you that you fuckers, <laughs> you fuckers are not going to get rid of I me. Lo Dude, I pretty <laughs> much wrote that in like a fucking article. Like, oh, really? <laughs> that's awesome. That's fucking awesome. And it is, I mean, I have, the two things that have got me through are like, one, I'm not going to be fucking bitter about this. I'm like, I'm not going to because I've I've like had people be like, hey, man, something similar happened to me. And I'm like, oh, yeah. And they're like, yeah, these fucking bitches. And I'm like, nope, nope, we can't be friends. Like, I don't want that. Right. I just want to move on and be the best version of myself that I can be. And I also don't want to play the fucking victim. However, right. like seeing that arm and like that was such a ballsy way to put it, because I I did kind of have like a relapse about this shit. Here's something really interesting that you guys will relate to that I, I haven't really talked about because there aren't a ton of people who could relate to this. But so I pretty much haven't been political for the last couple of years. And it's been great. Uh, I've always been on the wrong fucking side, by the way, of like, uh, like career wise, where I was super lefty under George Bush when people were like America, rah, 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 you can't criticize us after 9-11. Then everyone was happy about Obama. And then I talked about Obama drone striking people on Conan. And then Donald Trump's the president. And it was like, finally, we can be political. And I was like, I'm not going to talk about politics anymore. And so I've never really uh, I've never really calculated that correctly. But here's what's interesting. So I go on all these right wing shows. And I get a bunch of followers and not a ton, but like, let's say a thousand. And I'm I, I'm saying all my lefty stuff, but I'm also like hey, you know, the left has to talk to more conservatives. There's gray area. What we're talking about right now. And the majority of emails I got or DMs or whatever <clears throat> were like, hey, I don't agree with you politically, but I think it's really brave and tribalism is bad. I would mainly speak out against like tribalism. But then uh, George Floyd happened. And, and by happened, I mean, was uh, murdered by a cop. And for the first time, in a very long time, I posted a bunch of political stuff. And when I say Black Lives Matter, I don't mean like the institution or the organization, but I mean like the concept of like black people matter, <laughs> right? Like the very low bar. And dude, with suddenly all of these people that were like, man, we really love you because you like both sides. The second I was like talking about Black Lives Matter. I got so many, ma lost hundreds and hundreds of followers, then started yep. getting messages that were like, oh, didn't you learn your lesson when you were like a lefty before? Or like, hey, looks like fucking cuck McFeminist is back or whatever. And it's like, are your beliefs so fucking shallow 
that because mm -hmm. I went through what I went through in my personal life, that suddenly means that I'm not allowed to think fucking racist racism is bad systemic racism is bad and right. it just completely popped the bubble in this whole like i think there's a large group in this like we're above tribalism center right you know whatever who have made that their tribe that are completely full of shit right. um because yeah dude i lost that shit immediately and then i was like well fucking no one likes me so i might as well believe what i'm gonna believe and just like right. go back to being you know, like it's I, liberating i actually tell right-wing people that you guys you guys invented snowflakeism like this whole thing the, yes. this whole leftist being triggered being triggered all the time that's a new thing you guys you guys were you started cancel culture where like oh this is too sexy or two people kissing and this should be banned right video games or we should this cancel is gay video games. he's not wearing an american flag lapel <laughs> he shouldn't be the president like it was fucking crazy I, even right? even the university the university culture like if you look at any of these christian universities like liberty university bob jones university the restrictions they have on free speech there yeah. right mm -hmm. are absolutely like they're miles and miles beyond anything else that you've seen anywhere but anyway if we that, could but, all just admit that we're all fucking hypocrites that we all have <laughs> our beliefs and that like we should we can be open to conversation because right. yeah we are like all of us are fucking hypocrites all of us have been triggered all of us have been snowflakes all of us have been you know this and that all of us make an issue political when it's our side i mean how many times do you literally see you know something will happen and the left will be like oh here comes the right making it all political and then there's like a school shooting and then the right will go here comes the left making it all political well, what's it's wrong like, with making things political I know. Like, what what does it mean? It's, if something's political, it just means that you're elevating something that you feel strongly about. It means that into... guy's saying something that I don't want to fucking hear. So yeah, I'm like, going to say he's using uh, it to be political. Yeah, and I, I don't even know what's wrong with that. Why is it bad? Like, we all live in a society where we want... But anyway, We're so I, I want to... I wanted to actually get, like, for the... Because no. we've been talking about this for a while, but I want to talk about the comedy as well. But Armin, oh, yeah. go ahead. Sit last no, thing. just one thing. Like, I, I noticed how... Um, you know, I got so many people like uh, unfollowing me and abandoning me and uh, giving up their patronage. Uh, when I said, you know, do not resist the rest, whatever your color of your skin is, do not resist the rest. That, that yeah. that's good and put you in danger if you resist the rest. So a lot of left leaning people uh, thought that I was, I was being racist and left us uh, and uh, and left me right. But uh, then now this Trump thing. I can tell you, all the a lot of the people that were clapping are like, "Yes, Armin, tell them." Now they're all crying. I'm I'm collecting right. maga tears. That's what I call it. Yes. Uh, when I say like, "Oh, this there's no fraud," like I look at these, you guys are so loser. Like all of these conspiracy theories, bands, like now they're crying and they're leaving. And again, like we got um, same thing when it comes to religion. We got we got so many followers and supporters when we bashed Islam from like Hindutva people. Yeah. And now when we go after Hinduism, the same people that were cheering us on now they're leaving. So it's really hard, but but like I mean, to but the but the good thing about this, okay, so we can complain and be like, oh, people don't like we're being consistent and we're the only one that is like being objective, and that's why people don't follow us. But but to be fair, the people that stay with you, yes, they stay with you, yeah. like after all of this stuff. Yeah, well, it's I, enduring. I, yeah, yeah, you're fi you're finding. You're finding open-minded people. You're finding your, you know, I, I've just gotten to a point where I just want to make art. I just want to make people happy. I just want to make stuff that makes me happy. And that if I, what a line, James, um, and that I will, you know, I'd rather have that thousand true fans and live in an apartment my whole life, but do dope shit with like cool people that I actually like respect um then i would have as much money as i had when i lived in brooklyn and just be fucking miserable and not know what i'm doing and be i mean dude like my depression has like not gone away like i still it, it'll it'll flare up when things happen or when this shit comes up or whatever but like my baseline is pretty fucking happy like i wake up every day pretty fucking happy and i'm still i'm recovering from all this stuff um but it's i believe what i believe for the right reasons i'm not seeking out confrontation i'm seeking out 
joy and like mm-hmm. me trying to be happy and trying to make other people happy. And it's all those bullshit cliches and platitudes you hear about leading with love, loving yourself, all this stuff. And that's all I've been doing over fucking quarantine. That's how the album came out. That's how these like Instagram sketches came out. That's why I'm like fucking doing wrestling. Well, what I want to do since I was a kid, like everything. Um, and it's just not getting sucked back into that world because by the way, I've had like slip ups where suddenly I was like, when I started to lose all those right wing followers, I was like, okay, maybe I should start to try to get on like liberal shows and stuff like that. And I'm like, no, I'm not fucking being anti racist as a fucking career move. I'm just doing it because it's something I fucking believe. And that's when I pulled back because like I know how to shape the tweets that'll get retweeted and stuff like that. And I'm like, do I really believe this? Will this actually help? Or is this for my own fucking ego? And if it's for my ego, I don't do it anymore. Yeah, I I, so I gotta you know the, one of the things about this is like the, there is a lot of social media stuff. I, so many conversations we have are like, okay, so I did this, and then someone tweeted this, and then they tried to tweet and face it, and, and this is so much of the conversation right now, and it just makes you think like when historically anybody who brought about any kind of transformational change or any change in thinking, yep. right? they had 90% of the population opposing them vehemently. And, you know, it's it's sort of like, you know, the first woman who went to medical school or the first gay person who went out and said, I'm gay, right? And they, these people, if they were on Twitter at the time, they oh. would have to apologize two days later. I'm sorry about this tweet. Like, <laughs> it's just I not... shouldn't have gone to medical school. We need to ignore this. Like, I have this, you know, for a while I was... You know, I was, I've always been sort of left liberal. I've always been fairly consistent. And then, you know, what happens is I start talking about the regressive left in Islam. You know, I write the book. And then, yeah. uh, you know, I get a lot of support, like you said, from, you know, some of the right wing types. I'm on the Rubin show back way back when and, and yeah. all this stuff. And then, you know, I'm talking about how things are anti-woke and the whole woke thing is irrational. Yeah. And then George Floyd happens, and I'm like, I support Black Lives Matter, and I still do, exactly. right, just like you. Exactly. And then now I'm woke, so and I don't care. I don't yep. care, and I don't think anybody should. But a- my, so my question mm-hmm. to you is, with all of this stuff, with social media and everything, you have this album coming out. You used to do comedy before. You know, you had your appearance on Conan, like I think it was yeah. almost 10 years ago now. Cool. Um, and Oh, what was it? I think, yeah, I think 2011, oh, 2012. Yeah, 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 probably. Yeah, and then now, you know, you've got this new record coming out. How is the comedy different? How has all of this shaped the way that you write? Yeah, so first of all, with what you were saying, I just want to just, like, add on. Like, that was a great point. There's a line, and I don't know ex- the exact quote, but it's something about how revolutionaries are always the one with, like, arrows in their back, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and you are right about social media. And, you know, it's funny. Have you ever tried to explain to, like, a family member or someone who's not in political Twitter? Like, yeah, so, like, Maddie Iglesias tweeted something to this guy, and then he retweeted, and they're just like, I don't know any of these people. I don't give a fuck. Yeah. Like, it's not real. It's not real. Like, I live in Arizona now. I've only lived in LA and fucking Park Slope, Brooklyn. And I've been in Arizona, and I have conservative friends, and I have libertarian friends, and we agree on pretty much fucking everything. And then the people, I live in kind of like an old. <laughs> When my cat died, I just started making friends with a bunch of like old widows because I just wanted to play with their dogs. And then I would be like, my cat died. And they'd be like, my husband died. And now I'm just a weird tattooed guy who's friends with a bunch of like old ladies with dead husbands. (laughs) And I I love them dearly. And we talk all the time. And I know some of them voted for Trump. And some of them I walk by and I see fucking Fox News. And I'm like looking in the window for the dog. And I know for a fact that I've done more to bring joy to their life and that they've done more to bring joy to my life just through these human fucking interactions um that you know that's not saying if trump's putting fucking kids in cages to be like apathetic because i'm like i like old ladies now but Mm. it but not everyone who disagrees with you politically is a is the fucking monster that you would think they are if you were only on twitter and by the way i've changed a lot of fucking people's minds on issues to make them a little more lefty on a lot of issues because I haven't been a flaming fucking asshole to them and I treat mm-hmm. them like a human, right? And like, right. so even if you're trying to just be sneaky and you just want to convince people, being a fucking asshole isn't uh, the way to go. Uh, so with comedy, this is the first album I've written or I've done 
where I just got the fucking funny. Um, there was a point, I probably won't talk about this in other interviews, but um, it just fits this so well. There was a point when I was getting really big uh, in the lefty space that, and I would do these kind of rants that I would sit there and be like, okay, what lefty issue have I not done yet? And I would be like, okay, I guess I got to do like an abortion one or like, I guess I got to do like a vegan one. Whereas now I'm just talking about my life. Like it opens up talking about COVID. This is the first year I've ever been single because I'm codependent. And it's funny. I went from like thinking I was Bill Hicks to suddenly I think I'm edgy because I'm talking about dating because I've just never talked about dating. I've done stand up for fucking 16 years and I've never talked about it. I've never told sex stories. I've never whatever. And I do it in my own way. So like there was a Noam Chomsky reference that got edited out. Uh, and, but like, I talk about being lonely. I talk about like sadly dating 20 year olds who I have nothing in common with. I talk about, uh, I talk about, a, th there, there's a political sex story about when I was in that scene, a girl who told me to eat her feminist pussy and I get to do this whole fucking political sex joke, like shit that, Shit that I would have been like, am I even allowed to say the word pussy? And what's so fucking cool is I look at my audiences now at comedy clubs when like half of them don't know who I am. They just got free tickets. And I know there are fucking conservatives because I'm in Arizona. I know there are liberals because there are fucking 20 year olds there and they're all laughing at that same shit. And they're all, and then that means I can do something that trashes Republicans. And then I can do something that makes fun of woke people. And everyone is laughing at all the fucking things because I don't have a goddamn agenda. And I'm just honing my skills as a fucking comic. And I'm like, what is the funniest possible thing to say here? So that's the album, you know? And I'm really, all of my like Wokey McWoke albums went to number one. And I just, I told my manager, even though I'm not getting on a lot of shows, I've lost a lot of my following. I was like, dude, I'm going to get this to fucking number one. <laughs> like, it sounds so fucking crazy. But yeah, the political stuff is in line with what we're talking about. It goes after both sides. Um, it's filthy. It's fucking funny. It also talks about loneliness. It sounds like 2020. I didn't record it at any of my club dates. I record the reason it's called 25% capacity. I, I wanted to get it out before this year. So I wrote a lot of the material uh, in quarantine. A lot of it was written after doing like a lot of mushrooms. I talk about that on the album. And I was like, we just have to find in Minecraft. Uh, right. I don't know if YouTube allows us to say that. I don't know. Oh, by yeah, what? you did. You were doing mushrooms in Minecraft, I think. Oh no, no, no! I, I, uh, my is Minecraft the video game? No, we have to say. I, okay, that's just a oh. way of getting away against terms of service, oh. like drugs and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Right. Should you were doing mushrooms? Yeah. <laughs> right. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I was vividly dreaming and seeing how we're all connected in the universe. Um, I am so lost. Yeah. So no, I, 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 I don't. I'm know. with you, Armin. I got you. Um. So I talk about all this shit. And I recorded it. I just called my manager. I was like, we have to record it like this, this month. And so we, we found this fucking shady ass warehouse in outside. Like it was in Denver, I guess, technically. And it was so such a weird, it was an unmarked building. Um, apparently the motto was no cops. There was a cat wandering around there were like skulls on the fucking wall it was like kind of a brewery two fans came up to me after the show and said their uber driver didn't want to drop them off at the show because they were like this can't be the right address like you're being tricked like this is not a safe space for you to be in and that's where i recorded the album and i was like this sounds pretentious artsy but i was like i want it to sound like 2020 if i recorded an album in like one of these club shows, it just didn't sound like what I was going through. So this sounds like I'm doing an album in front of fucking 30 people. You know, I've done my other albums that like sold out comedy clubs or my first two were at a theater from Chicago. And I was like, nope, I'm doing it at a warehouse in front of 25 masked people in a dangerous part of town 
with, I guess, a cat roaming around. Um, and it was fucking awesome. Like, I'm really proud of it. And I'm not proud of a ton that I do, but I'm really proud of it. Uh, that's so sweet. Yeah. I have a question. Mm-hmm. Yes. Actually, this is very interesting because I always felt like, I know this is like cheesy, you know, but I always felt like people, a lot of people um, look at their ideas uh, that they want to say that they believe in and signal to the world more based on who's welcoming me, which community I want to belong to, which tribe I belong to, yeah. rather than looking at the ideas and like, okay, does this, I, do these ideas reflect objective reality or not, right? Yeah. They don't, like that's not the test. The test is not like, do these ideas are, are reflect objective reality? Like, no, who's welcoming me? Who's going to be nice to me? Who do I think like, a, but I always felt like, you know what? I don't like people like us here. We like, you know, even if all of you hate me, these ideas are right. I don't care if you do welcome me or not. Okay. These yeah. are the right ideas. These are the right ideas that makes the world a better place. So when it comes to believing in things, that's my that's what my philosophy uh is. But it's actually what based on what you're saying, it seems like it's the same thing with what's funny, right? Yeah. Like you know, so what whatever political or philosophical ideology you build, it has to be independent of what community of people you want to feel like you belong to. And I guess. Same applies with comedy and what's funny. Yeah. It's just objectively, are they laughing? And it's like, okay, cool. This is funny. But Armin, would you I'm glad you said what you were saying. It's so funny that every time any of us say something authentic, we're like, this is cheesy and stupid. And like (laughs) I'm still a man, but like also I have feelings. Um, but it's true, man. We're like and it does get fucking here, I'll 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 double down on the vulnerability. It gets fucking sad. Where you're just like, why is it so hard? To just say the truth. And like you said, like, not because you want to like trash a group or whatever, because you're legitimately trying to do a good thing. You're legitimate. I mean, dude, going back to not that I want to go back to it, but like, that's how I felt where I was like, so if I was just a comic and again, I was a pretentious asshole, that's what got me in trouble. But if I was just a comic on stage talking about fucking cheating, talking about like getting road pussy, stuff like that, none of this would have happened. My life would have been fucking fine, but it was because like, and again, this is gross to say, but like, I really thought I was doing like the right thing, you know? And like, if I did (laughs) want to go down that fucking victim road of like, I was just trying to help women and like, or, or, or then the opposite, like I'm never fucking sticking up for those minxes again. Is that a, that's like a word from the forties, but like, you know what I'm saying? Like it's, it is a, a, you, you definitely, I'm sure that both of you have had moments where it just gets fucking frustrating and you're like, God, it would be a lot easier if I just went this fucking easy route, but it's then you're inauthentic. You know, I thought about this the other day where even if I did like quote unquote sell out and I went the Ruben, whatever I'm like, it it wouldn't have been good. Like when you're Mm. being inauthentic, it just, you fucking reek of it. And even if I have less fans now, at least the fans I have know that I'm being honest and truthful. And by the way, also know that I could change my mind. Because that's fucking okay, too. That's another thing that's not allowed anymore. You're not allowed to change your fucking mind on an issue. Counterpoint, though. Counterpoint. Yeah. we like, oh, wish it was easier. Wish it was easier. But, like, I mean, come on. It is, really like, to put things in perspective, Yeah, it is a lot easier. We used to get, people like us used to be burned alive or have their head chopped off, right? Uh, yeah. I mean getting people coming at you and Twitter and suspending you and yeah. trying to cancel L- you. Let me rephrase yeah. that. Easier for me, a white guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, so I, uh, so I think, you know, Ar- Armin's got a point. I, cause I hear people talk about how it's really hard to do comedy. Now it's really hard to joke without getting canceled. And th- that's a lot of that is very sort of Twitter centric conversation. Dude. In the, yes. yes. So like, I'll, I'll give you an example. Like I go to, you know, I have, I have a day job, you know, where I go to work, I remember talking to somebody about, oh, did you hear what Jordan Peterson said? And nobody knew who Jordan Peterson was. Nope. They they didn't know who Jordan Peterson was. A lot of them don't know who Ben Shapiro is. Like they don't know any of this stuff. Most regular people don't know. And and so the comedy world is at war with this guy. Apparently, he mentioned me the other day. I'm not even gonna say his name. There's just some like comedy journalist, and he has like five thousand fans or something. 
and he just goes, he's trying to get club shut down and he goes after these really offensive comedians and then these offensive comedians go after him. No one, no one in the real world. No, no I, and people talk about Louis C.K. They'll bring up Louis C.K. as like the best comic, and then you go to make like a a joke because you're like, are we not? Are we going to talk about the dick thing? And they're like, oh yeah, didn't a thing happen? And that was like the biggest of the cancellations. Um, and people, well, like, I mean, but it was probably bug. I mean, the, look, the thing is, the, maybe three of the top ten comics of all time um, were and still are, right? Bill Cosby. Uh, Woody Allen and Louis C.K. I mean, they, they just are. I mean, it doesn't yeah. change any of their work. Now, the thing is... The, with, and you guys heard what happened to Jim Gaffigan, right? No, I don't know. What no, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. Oh, my God. I was like, okay. Well, I'm, no, I know... The, he hot, the, the Hot Pocket guy? <laughs> no, but here, here's the thing. Like, I, I don't think that this stuff plays out in the real world the way it does online. So I tried to get tickets. Like, I, Louis C.K. was coming to Toronto. I think he was doing five nights in a row. Yep. Um, Five nights in a fucking row, and he yep. came in, and I tried to get to, and it was all sold out. Okay, I saw so him here. I saw him here. I was so fucking curious that I saw him yeah. here in Arizona. Yeah, sold out theater. It was great. I, absolutely, I I couldn't get I couldn't get tickets. So these guys, they're back. They're touring. I mean, you've got this album come out, and one of the parallels, and I, I think I mentioned this to you before, like before we were on the air, is that um, what with Louis C.K. with his main story is he really made it big when he hit 40, right? And yeah. he was doing comedy for I think like a decade and a half or something. Um, and then uh, he started talking instead of like writing his jokes sort of the way that he did, he started talking about his life because he thought nobody would be interested in his kids, nobody would yep. be interested in the other stuff he was doing. And then he just turned it around and started talking about his life and he hit it big. Yeah. Uh, George Carlin had a similar story. I mean, he was um, he was squeaky clean, you know, a lot of physical comedy, and and yep. he he did pretty well. But when he actually started getting authentic and talking about, you know, what he really thought, he and, became and, George Carlin. As people relate to you, man, people out in the real world, I I think there is a big pushback happening against this sort of uh, getting pissed off at everything wokeness thing, um, and that's why that's why then Biden's president, Bernie, you know, he he beat Bernie soundly in the in the primaries too. I mean, there's even most liberals uh, are kind of getting tired of the self righteousness and the the sort of high moral horse that uh, you know a lot of people are on. Yeah, well, and I saw. Uh... <laughs> And you also wonder, like, what would happen to Carlin or Hicks or, like, Susanna in the chat just brought up fucking Pryor. Like, Pryor literally talked about, like, uh, Pryor, maybe the best comedian in the world, brought yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, literally, literally talked about, like, doing crack and abusing his wife. And, like, you know what I mean? Like, the my biggest problem with cancel culture isn't that, like, you know, assholes aren't being are being called out but it's also that there's no room for forgiveness and that was one of the things that i really loved about the left was prison reform was this idea of like redemption right and like people being in like horrible fucking uh situations and coming back as like better more evolved human beings and with cancel culture like people just wanted louis to die people just wanted me to die like you should never fucking work again and it's like, look, that's what courts are for, right? That's what prison's for. And 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 if you don't want to see someone like that's cool. But the other thing I've noticed is that a lot of comedians are doubling down and being infinitely more like offensive, quote unquote, than mm. they would have been in the first place. Because just like we were talking about that tribalism doubling down to defend your own. It's like, dude, I never heard so many Asian slurs until Shane Gillis got canceled from SNL for saying something that like was part of a bit and wasn't even racist. And suddenly comics were like, oh, we can't fucking talk about Asian people now. And suddenly I heard so many fucking Asian jokes because comics want to do the thing where they're doing the edgy thing you're not supposed to do. Right. You know, this uh, is why this is why comedians. Mm -hmm. This is why comedians are at the front lines of normalizing dissent. Always have been. Always, always will be. Been. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's we. It, 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 it's so weird. This sort of war with comedy now. But again, I don't think it happens in the real world. Right. Because remember, two comics who have gotten so much shit from the left are fucking Chappelle and Burr. The two like biggest comics fucking right and now. Two like, of the best Netflix specials last year. Actually. Well, and also they hosted fucking SNL, super woke SNL. It's like, I think this Twitter world we live in, it's mm. almost, 
It's like cancel culture they, hipsters. They where, canceled where, Kevin Hart. I mean, Kevin Hart. He's right. like a sweetheart. Like they just, I, I man. You know the the thing is, I I just think it's coming back around. I I think you're right. One of the things that we have in common is like you know with Armin Navabi, when someone tells him that you cannot draw this cartoon. He oh, says, yeah. "Fuck you! I'm gonna yeah. go this cartoon, and I'm gonna draw ten more." And yeah, that's, yeah. I think, what com- like I remember, I know what comic is like. You know, when you're at a comedy show I'll, and you hear, I'll someone, show you the cartoon after the live stream yeah. is over. Then. And yeah. you, you know, you have the uh, you, you have someone telling a comic is like, okay, when you go on stage, just try not to mention this or that. And most of the time, most of these people, the good comics will go up. Uh, and they will specifically make it a point to talk about that thing they were told not that, to talk about. That's what that's what I do. That's, I remember, it, it, I remember that's, once when I realized I had to go back and start training jujitsu again was when I got booed so badly at a one a.m. show in Scotland where the uh, where the security guard had to get me off stage because, and I quote, he said, I've never heard such specific threats being shouted at someone. And what happened was I was doing all this like pro abortion stuff and they were screaming at me and yeah, literally instead of trying to win the back, I mean, now I can like win an audience back, but I just went, you know what? You guys must've just misunderstood. Let me start again. And I just started doing my entire set verbatim word for word again and they just lost their goddamn minds um armin i want to ask you a question i want to ask you advice is i still try to avoid confrontation i think you would have been very proud of me before the show because I, I i don't know you guys really well so when i got this text that was like uh, some of the patrons want to talk about and just seeing the word allegations when it was like I cheated, like it, it makes my stomach fucking churn. Uh-huh. I'm like, oh, so these gossipy fucks pay you fucking five dollars a fucking month and they want to trudge up some bullshit from eight years ago because that's how they fucking sustain themselves <laughs> because they don't have a fucking life and they just want to like prey on other people's fucking faults so that they don't have to realize that they hate their job and they're in a love with marriage. <laughs> and I just like lost my shit, all this like peace and loving. And then I called my manager and I was like, no, I should just do the show and be myself and win people over because that's all I can do. But there's a part of me, dude, uh, and this is to Armin with the cartoon thing, where, like, I just got sad at first. And I'm like, maybe I just shouldn't do it. And, like, do you have moments like mm-hmm. that? Like, like when you go, oh, I can't write this? Fuck you. Or, like, I still don't tweet stuff that aggressively anymore. Um, I, I mean, I guess I will. I, I But the... But not, I mean, not really. I still, I feel like I've kind of like, because I'm living a life now and I get to make stuff and I know I'm helping people or whatever, I don't love rocking the boat, even though I still mm. do. I do on stage and I will, but like on social media and stuff, are you, but I have friends, man, that are just so fucking confident that they're like, I know I'm doing the right thing. Go fuck yourself. I'm an artist. Do you, when you do that stuff, are you like pissed you have to do it? Or do you have that kind of just confidence of like, fuck you guys, I'm doing it, I don't care. Uh, okay, so first of all, I do agree with both methods. I think like there's two different methods for different different strategies for different goals, right? When when it comes to changing people's opinions, like, I don't know, Trumpists or wokey leftists or Muslim, fundamentalist Muslims or average Muslims or Hindus or Christians, I always think like being friendly, being nice, having one-on-one conversations with them yeah, that too. shows that you could get along even if you have passionate disagreements with each other, that works the best, okay? That works the best being friendly with them uh, but when it comes when when we go out full on aggressive and offensive that is not necessarily for changing people's opinion about something that is because we're pushing back against red lines that are being drawn against that has a different goal that's not about like oh you're, hey muslims have you considered that islam could be complete bs that's a different thing when people say you can't draw this you can't say this that's the tactic that we use to be like no we're gonna double like okay. whatever every time you draw a red line around us we're gonna double down against this yes. because you're, if we don't your red lines are gonna turn into walls okay yes. we're gonna be as offensive as we possibly can be and we're gonna push back against it so that's why we use that strategy just do I something like I, I yeah I, I wish I didn't have to it would be so much easier if we didn't have to do right. that. like but usually usually it doesn't get to me because I've, I'm used to it but this recently because of the for the past 15 years it, um, like I had to move, to, uh, I had to change address twice because of death threats, right? Yeah. Um, and I had to, there's, you know, I, I, I couldn't go see my mom 
um, when she was she got cancer because if I did, I would have been hanged oh. to death, you know. So like I, but but only recently I felt like maybe I should stop. But then I doubled down after because recently I went after um, I started blaspheming against Hinduism, and these people decided not to come after me. They decided to go after my family um, and seeing members of my family, for example, uh, get the backlash That's was nice. first time I felt, I felt like maybe, you know, maybe it's not worth it. But then yeah. I quickly got over that and yeah. then like, you know what, there are way. OK, this is what get, keeps me going. Like there are people that are paying much, much higher prices than we are for the things that they're saying. There are secular activists right now in Bangladesh, in Saudi Arabia, in Iran, and even in Malaysia and Tunisia and Egypt. And these people are at the front lines of fighting for normalizing dissent, normalizing blasphemy, normalizing, uh, fighting for freedom of expression. And they're paying for their, with their lives and their safety and their security and their freedom. So I felt like, you know what, I'm not really in a position to complain just because people are making pornographic images of children in my family, of children right. in my family, and, sp right. and making sure it gets to them and they see it. I like, yeah, that's tough and all, but it's not really something that could stop me. Yeah. So that's my answer. Yeah. I, awesome, I want to add one thing to that. Like a, a similar, the one time that this happened to me, and I remember pretty distinctly, is when uh, the, there was a Bangladeshi secular blogger named um, uh, Avijit Roy. He was actually from Atlanta. He was American. Um, and he went to uh, Dhaka in Bangladesh for a book fair. And over there, he was attacked by these fundamentalists, and he was basically he was hacked to death in the streets with just in the streets in front of people with Whoa. machetes, right? So he was killed, and then we heard about it. And I had corresponded with him, I think, like two weeks before he died. Yeah. Um, at that point, I, I was talking to you know Fessel Said Al Mutar, who's the Iraqi refugee activist right, who runs uh, uh, Ideas Beyond Borders. And we, because we used to work together a lot, uh, and I, uh, you know, we, we talked, but like, should we, is it really worth it? I mean, this is insane because yeah. that's the first time I thought, I was like, this is, this feels so personal, so close to home. And, you know, we, we also have other friends who are in jail in Saudi Arabia, in Pakistan, uh, places like that. So, you know, when, and then we just thought, we're like, okay, if we do this, if we stop doing it, then, uh, his death is in vain. They All these people in their prison, in, in prison, like they're, they're in vain. I mean, they, there are political dissidents. They are there are actors, there's comedians, there's women's rights activists in Saudi Arabia right, right. who helped women get the right to drive in Saudi Arabia, but they are still in jail for Whoa. fighting for that right, which is Jesus. now legal. Right. Like the the whole thing is, so you can't you can't stop this. It is the right thing to do always right is when someone tells you that you can't do something you have to push back like is what because what armin said i'm going to use that a lot is those red lines that they put around you eventually they become walls yeah if you don't well, erase them right there well and that's also why it just you actually have to believe in the things like if you didn't truly believe in the oh by the way thank you guys for those stories now i know how to handle when i put out my next pro rape album um <laughs> but if you don't if you don't actually believe and have that conviction, like in a weird way, even though I'm fighting less on Twitter and I may seem like less political, I, my beliefs are so much stronger. And when I do say something political, like, you know, I, I have I'm like my Instagram, I just make like comedy sketches. And, and when I started, a lot of them were just like jujitsu stuff. So I got like just a lot of fighters and stuff. Um, and when I started posting about George Floyd, um, yeah, I lost a lot of them, like I said. And then the next day I doubled down where I was just like, I did a quote unquote apology uh, video to all the followers I lost and just fucking railed them. And it felt, it's weird, maybe because I do do it less, um, but it was just because it was something I truly, truly cared about. Yeah, you get that feeling where you're like, Fuck you guys. This is authentic. I know I'm in the right. I know I'm doing the right thing. Um, and then, and it does make it easier. But would I want to do that like all day, every day now? I'm like, no, nah, I'd rather like hang out but, with the widows and their dogs. Even if, even if you're not in the right, you just, you know, you did your best to try to 
like it's, it's possible that I, we got it wrong. Maybe we're not in the right, but sure. I, at least I know that the position I have is me honestly looking at everything and trying to come up, doing my best to come up with a position that I think is correct without any worry about who I'm being loyal to or who is going to like pull their support away from me. Yeah. This, I don't know if this position that I have is true. I don't know. I just know that I did my best to, to get to what is true. Yeah, Even and I mean, seeking. that's why, like, because you know what yes. you—that's th what you're doing—is when you're trying to find what you think. There's a process that you go through, and what they're doing right now with all of the the pushback and stuff. If you start listening to it, you that process is what gets well, hijacked. And when you're, right? yeah, when you're just shouting people down, there's no, hey, let's figure this out together. You know what I mean? Like, I still look, there are still jokes that I'm like, ugh, like, I don't like that. Or like, <laughs> this person will say this or whatever. But it's like, well, we can talk about it as artists instead of people who are trying to completely silence uh, others, right? We can talk about these political issues as people who, hey, you're a Republican, I'm a liberal, we both care about our families and want our children to grow up in like a safe place. Cool. Let's talk about why your solutions would work and why my solutions would work instead of just fucking screaming at each other. And yeah, you know what? That is the beautiful thing about comedy is we talk about comedy getting canceled and stuff like that. But the real beautiful thing about comedy, as I saw all this week when I did shows in Arizona and even when I said my lefty stuff, fuck, I had like a Palestine reference, um, which is the um, which is laughter when done properly. Um it can break the ice and kind of alleviate the tension of a contentious topic. Mm -hmm. And once that ice is broken and once someone who disagrees with you has laughed at you, they don't look at you as the fucking enemy anymore. And now when they come up to you after the show, they go, Hey man, I didn't fucking agree, but that was funny. And then you go, Oh, what did you not agree on? And then you talk and you're like, we actually agree on like more that's, than you think we agree. that's the thing that comedy does that's what storytelling does that's what art does is that mm -hmm. i i feel like these forms of um these art forms are so much more effective in getting people to disarm and sort of just be open to other points of view like when you cry at a movie or when you laugh at a comedian even if they're saying something that you don't agree with yeah. right you are you have become more open to it and you don't even have to agree with it later but at least you'll understand i, right? I laugh harder sometimes I mean, maybe that's just me being a comic but i laugh harder sometimes when i disagree mm -hmm. when burr will go into something that sounds like it's going to be so fucking sexist and then when he makes it funny like yeah. oh my god it's like it's the greatest thing in the world and i mean the thing is like comedy comes from fucking trauma like whenever i do interviews um and they're like, hey, were you the class, like, for people who don't know me, who don't know my tragic backstory, are like, hey, were you the class clown? And I'm like, no, the class clown beat the shit out of me and called me gay. Like, the reason that I became funny is because, like, my mom was an alcoholic, is that, like, my dad had fucking anger issues. They're better now, but, like, and that, like, when one of them, like, when the ambulance was pulling up to our house on, like, fucking Christmas or, like, some ridiculous situation that we've been in, me and my brothers were trying to make each other laugh because once we could laugh, we, that would stop us from fucking crying, and then we could start to, like, it breaks the ice, and then we could start to battle plan. Like, what the fuck are we going to do now? Like, my humor was straight up developed as a self-defense mechanism, not because, like, I wanted attention. Mm. Yeah. But, uh, Ali, we need to end this soon. But I just want to say, I just want to really quickly say, so we need to go after this. We need to plug Jamie's way. Yeah, yeah. Talk, I got all that. Go ahead. Yeah. Do so, what you're say. but before, before I, I just want to highlight that we don't need to, like, uh, my, per my I personally don't think we. Uh, it's not very. It's not. I. This is my personal belief. Maybe it's wrong, but um, it's not a good idea to tell people like, "Hey, let's get along," because look, we agree and stuff. Because I don't want to suggest. I don't want to promote the idea that we need to agree to be able to get along. Yes. I want to promote the idea that we could passionately disagree and be fundamentally against all each other's positions uh, and argue about them and still get along, right? Yeah. So I do want to highlight our disagreements more than our agreements and then demonstrate that we could still be friends as a way to make uh, agreements not a con condition for friendship. 
Yeah, yeah. like Armin and I have had some pretty heated exchanges here on this podcast and previous episodes, and we don't agree on everything. In fact, we disagree on a lot. But yeah, um, well, that's why you reported him on Twitter and got him. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that was me, so, Jamie. Why? Why did you have to say it? I just want to. I just want to sell as many albums as possible, man. Okay. I'll, I'll do whatever it takes. Well, let's, let's do that. Let's do well, that now. It's very soon that your album is drop it's called 25 percent capacity it's going to be in spotify it's going to be on itunes it's going to be everywhere and you're going to do a live comedy tomorrow at what time yeah so wanna... hold on let me get it up you uh your fucking your connection started to break up right as you were plugging the album and i was like no Shit. okay so i'll see it again so I'll have all the links in my bios. Um, so you can follow me on Instagram, which is at the Jamie Kilstein. My Twitter is just Jamie Kilstein. Um, and yeah, the links are in the bio. Jamie Kilstein, 25% capacity. It'll be on Spot Spotify, iTunes, all that stuff. Uh, fucking even if you're like, this guy's not funny, but I agree with him. Or like, man, I feel bad for him. Like, I don't want him to kill himself. Just put fucking <laughs> put it on Spotify. It's free. And put it on mute and just stream it. Like, I'm... So God, this is either going to be my swan song or my callback or my comeback where I'm like, I'm, I want to get this shit to fucking number one. Um, so yeah, so you can get it on all the streaming services. Follow me on social media. The live stream is on my Facebook and YouTube. Man, I wonder if people are going to come to that. Um, that is at 8 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Mountain Time, 5 p.m. Pacific Time on my Facebook, which is Jamie Kilstein fan page. Um, or YouTube, youtube.com slash. Well, see, Jamie you Kilstein. did, yeah, you, you did all of my work for me. So, you know, that's all there. And we're going to put all right. those links into the description yeah. when this, this episode is, comes out. Um, by the I, way, I wanted, this, this might yeah. come out a little bit later for our public audience, which is like right now, it's just being only our patrons are watching this live, right? By the way, if you're not a patron, become a patron so you can watch this live with us. But right. by the time it gets public, the audio version gets public, uh, the live, your show might have been already over, but people can still go get it. Yeah, so, uh, the, so the album is the most important. As long as it comes out fucking next week, this like this whole next week. So from here till next Friday, the uh, 11th um, right. is when we can like get this shit on the fucking to chart. Um, and then, uh, yeah. And then I can, I mean, if they just Google 25, if they just Google 25% capacity, Jamie, um, yeah, my yeah. web, my website's Jamie Oh, I also right. have, a, I also have a podcast. Uh, the podcast is called a fuck ups guide to self help. Right. Um, where That's I've nice. had everyone from fucking diamond Dallas page, a WWE hall of famer to, you know, uh, comedians to, I mean, everybody. And we're all talking about being fuck ups and getting better and owning our shit and going after weird dreams and right. uh it's a cool community um yes. as well yeah. yeah so and i i just want to say to everybody I, I think that right now we're at a point where more people are able to talk about what they want to talk about than anytime else this idea that you can't talk about things a lot of this is twitter centric um we just need to cut out the noise uh, and just go out yeah. and do our shit L yeah. listen louis ck is still selling out like, dude, I know you're right. I, I, so, I, I mean, it's, no, there's you no, know there's, what? There are other consequences. I'm really mm -hmm. glad you. I'm I'm really glad you said that because that's gonna actually encourage me because mm -hmm. you know it is harder for someone like me. Louis had a huge following before his shit happened, whereas mm -hmm. like I'm still trying to find people, and mm -hmm. a lot of that involves social media, and a lot of that involves people fucking googling me. I've had many first dates that did not make it to the first date, and I was just like, well, they found out my last name, and uh, and you know. But I think there are enough people who I, I honestly think that if you are authentically trying to be the best version of yourself and you're saying things that you are passionate about, that you believe in, or, you know, if you're a comedian, you're being funny. If you're an artist, you're just putting the art out there, man, I want to go on Joey Diaz so bad. He texted me, he texted me when my cat died. He's a sweetheart, but I've never done his fucking podcast. Um, yeah. Stoney, tell him, tell him to have me on. But the, uh, you know, I think that, uh, I think it'll work out. You know, and at the very least, it's like, look, I don't have as much money as I used to have, but I know I'm fucking funnier. I know I'm happier. I know I'm a better person. So, like, I kind of win already. Yeah, I, 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 like, I like the story and I can't wait to hear it, man. Dude, All I'm right. so excited to hear what you guys uh, think. I hope you like it. I'm yeah, a fan now. that's I'm great. Fan. Thank you for joining us. Jamie Kilstein, 25% uh, capacity. And then, uh, you know, check yeah. it out and hear it and tell your friends.
and become a patron unless you're struggling financially if you're struggling financially do not become a patron i'm telling you do not if, if you're struggling financially and you consider like oh i like this guy maybe i should support him nope do not do not stop it all right yep. i cannot become a patron <laughs> <laughs> I'll go support Jamie so that maybe one day he can become. That's the goal. Yeah. yeah. Yes. All right. All right. All right. Okay. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, hey, guys. wait one second. I need to show you the, uh, the drawing. Oh, yeah. The yeah, secular sorry. jihadists have been made possible thanks to the Illuminati and the covert support of Israel and the CIA. That's what we have been told, but we haven't received our checks yet. If you like what we do, please support us. Share the podcast with your friends. Write and tweet us with topic and guest suggestions. Or head over to secularjihadist.com and give a dollar or more for exclusive access to live video. Have your questions read and answered on the air and more. Till next time, may the flying spaghetti monster be with you.